I'm Councillor Dr. Yvette Chasson Wara. I'm the establishment coordinator of the Angie Brooks International Center for Women's Empowerment, Leadership Development, International Peace and Security. The International Center originated in 2009 when we had a colloquium of the same name, a colloquium on women's empowerment, leadership development, international peace and security that was co-convened by President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of Liberia and President Taja Halona of Finland. And at that time we had the Council of Women World Leaders convening for the first time outside of the first world. And at that convention we decided that we will have something concrete coming out of the International Colloquium and they asked me to establish the Angie Brooks International Center, naming it after Angie Brooks and in that way naming it for women worldwide. Angie Brooks was actually a Liberian lawyer. She was a jurist, but she was also the first African woman who was president of the United Nations General Assembly. Till this day, she's the only African woman who's been president of the UN General Assembly. And she was a Liberian. She also became a member of our Supreme Court. The Angie Brooks International Center has contributed to the African continent on a whole one because of the work that we do in international peace and security. For the first time, you have women leading interventions, not only in their home country, but across Africa as we do uh, our work in the Women's Situation Room. So the Angie Brooks International Center has what is called the Women's Situation Room. And that is a mechanism where we use both the youth and the women to lead peace processes in our countries as we go towards elections and it's now been mandated by the African Union as a best practice and the Angie Brooks International Center has been asked to replicate it throughout all African countries during elections. The Women's Situation Room was founded in 2011 in Liberia as we went towards our presidential and legislative elections. We the women of Liberia saw that we were going towards violence the way in which things were being portrayed in the media. If you listen to the talk shows in the morning and you hear how people were actually revving things up and putting people against each other, pitting them against each other. And also if you read the newspapers, I mean your blood just started to boil. People were becoming really angry and thinking of doing stupid things. So we the women of Liberia decided we were not going to backslide into an era of war from whence we had come. And we were not going to have it because the women of Liberia had been pivotal in achieving the peace in this country. We called together the women organizations in Liberia and said, look, this is where we find ourselves and this is not what we want. We therefore need to have a plan B. If these people continue the way they are going, we see this country actually going towards war over an election. What can we do? So we looked at it, we analyzed it, and we found there were two major culprits in this whole thing. One, of course, was the media, was number one, because of the way in which they were portraying things. And number two were both victims and perpetrators who were our youth. And the youth we were talking about were the disadvantaged, disenfranchised young people who live in our ghettos. The media bosses listened to us and decided to work with us in seeing how we could train them and join the training that they were already about to start. Luckily, we did that. We train them not only in responsible reporting, but also in gender reporting, reporting of a gender lens. Because we found out as they reported the female aspirants, they were reporting them differently than they were the men. When they start talking about me, if I'm a woman and I'm running for office, they're talking about how I look, whether I'm showing my cleavage, whether I'm showing my legs. But you will never hear them talk about a man and say, oh, I saw his chest hair, his thigh shirt was open, or I saw his calf and he had muscles or he didn't. They never talk about his physicality. They always talked about the ideas he brought to the table and whether or not they were rational or they were implementable. And we wanted to see women treated the same way. So we then taught them how to report with a gender's lens. So that's how the Women's Situation Room started. We also have the fact that we have what we call our Pink Panthers. Our Pink Panthers are female commercial motorcyclists. What had happened in, and this is in Liberia, what happened in Liberia is we had young women who wanted to ride motorcycles. In Liberia, we call them Pem Pem Boys. The rest of uh, West Africa, they're usually called Border Borders. But anyway, 
they are commercial motorcyclists and we had some young girls who wanted to ride to be able to earn their living but they found out as they went ahead and paid for the use of the motorcycles from the young men the young men would take their money but also sexually molest them it came to my attention and we decided to do something about it and the first thing we did is we went in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. And UNDP, in collaboration with the Anti Brooks International Center, agreed for us to purchase motorcycles for all of these young women, which we did. We then purchased motorcycles for them, made sure that we brought in the police to train them on how to properly ride according to the laws of Liberia. We also brought in the people from whom we bought the motorcycles in because they had to learn how to put together and take apart the motorcycles. We didn't want them depending on men to change tires, to change oil, to fix the gear. So we, they had to learn all of that before they could earn their motorcycles. We then also brought in LBDI, Liberian Bank for Development International, and they came in as our partners to be able to set up a program whereby they would pay into a fund, a revolving fund, the money for the purchase of the motorcycles because this is a business, not a grant. So they are paying for the motorcycles. And when they pay the money back into that grant, what UNDP has agreed with Angie Brooks to do is that money now goes towards the purchasing of motorcycles for other women who are in the interior of Liberia. And that is how it revolves. The beneficiary of Angie Brooks domestically are the women of Liberia and the youth of Liberia because we do a lot of work with the youth and the women. We have our Chief Soakoko Center, which is in Bung County. And and that center deals with adult literacy and in it is the rural women of Liberia that actually do programs up at the Chief Soakoko Center including including adult literacy so they are beneficiaries. We also have beneficiaries throughout Africa because as we implement the Women's Situation Room so it is that countries benefit from the peace and security aspect that comes in with the elections and the peace and security that we ensure and sustain before, during and after elections in these countries. And it's very important that we do this because it shows the women of Africa what it is women in leadership can do. Angie Brooks herself was a very prominent jurist. Not only that, when she sat as president of the UN Security Council, she did a lot of work in Rwanda for the Trusteeship Council. She really looked into the Trusteeship Council of the United Nations and was able to sustain Rwanda at that time and many other countries. So she was extraordinary in not only in law, but in administration, especially in international development administration. The WSR is unique in every country. We've never implemented it the same in any two countries. We have what we call tools of the WSR, and we take them and show our sisters in the countries, okay, this is what we have, these are things we can do. But I want to be clear that every country we've gone to, they have brought something and added it to the WSR. That's what makes it so flexible, so unique, and so innovative. The relationship that we have with the African leaders is, if we enter your country, first of all, we're entering it at the invitation of women only. We do not accept invitations from presidents to enter their countries. The Women's Situation Room is an empowerment of women. It's letting the ordinary woman know, I don't have to be a member of a political party to participate in the fundamental democracy of my country, which is elections. I can do elections without being a part of a party, which you know is usually a male hierarchy, male patriarchy that's involved. So most women don't even want to be part of political parties. However, it is the women's duty to maintain peace and security in their countries. Because when it comes down to war, 
we are the most affected. It is us who are running and looking for food. It is us who's looking for shelter for our children. It is us who trying to normalize the children's lives, trying to send them to school even when guns are blowing up. We're still trying to send our children to school and giving them a sense of normalcy. It's us who gotta look for water and see that they eat every day. So we are the most affected when war comes. Therefore, we must be very clear that the maintenance of peace and security is something every woman better go ahead and make sure she is a part of. And that's why the Women's Situation Room brings the ordinary woman all the way up to the top woman involved in peace and security. In the first place after Liberia in 2011, we then went to Senegal and we did the Senegalese election. And at that time, Macky Sall became president of Senegal. And again, it was an innovative thing. It was the first time the Senegalese actually saw the potential for violence on the ground. Because at the time, they had a youth group that was very militant and started to run into mosques and, and do all kinds of disturbances. And the Women's Situation Room intervened. After Senegal, we then went to Kenya. And again, with, with women's situation room in Kenya because of the vastness of Kenya is so huge we had to go throughout the length and breadth of Kenya and we saw there again a mitigation of the violence in Kenya because of the women situation room in Kenya we went to Uganda Uganda was extraordinary and the reason Uganda was extraordinary is that we were able to intervene to the extent that President Museveni of his own accord decided because of the credibility that the women's situation room brought. The fact that we're nonpartisan, we don't take sides. The only thing we're there for is the peace in that country. And he saw that as the Dr. Bisaji, who was the main opposition, they independently decided that the women's situation room had the credibility to be the facilitator of a peace dialogue between the two of them. Right now, as we sit, that peace dialogue is being initiated by the Women's Situation Room, bringing on partners like the elders and the religious leaders, etc., who are also joining us to make sure that by the time Uganda goes to its next elections, we would have at least mitigated some of the causes of the disturbances in Uganda. After Uganda, we went to Nigeria. We got to Nigeria, and I had my meeting with the um, with the NEC, the National Elections Commission. They told me, they said, Councillor, we already know of the Women's Situation Room. And the work that you do mitigates our work. It helps us because we have a call center and that call center is open 24 hours a day. And we make sure that the ordinary citizen has access to the call center. And we give them a short code on whatever GSM line they're on to call in and it's free. And then they tell us, what the problem is or what they anticipate it is. Once it has to do with violence or conflict of the election, they will call it in. We then pick up the phone at that time. We'll pick up the phone. If it was police related, we'll call the police. If it was neck related, we'll call the National Elections Commission. And so that's how we're doing it when we got to Nigeria. The WSR uses the elections as a pivotal point, an entree point into countries, like I said, when the women write and ask us to implement. However, the mandate of the WSR is peace before, during, and after elections. That's why you see the after elections, like in Uganda, we continue our work and we'll continue it all the way into the next electoral cycle. Before we come in and we assess and we look at things and see what happened. During, we also look at things and make sure that we have peace during elections. After elections is where the women of the country, the eminent women, have to then interact with both the youth and the other women on the ground to say to them, okay, this is where we are. We now have peace. We now have had elections. What is it that we want going forward? We've seen that in Liberia. What happened in Liberia at the end of the Liberian elections, which happened in what December of 2017 was our second round. The eminent women, together with the vice president of Liberia, got together and we did what was called the Women's Consultative Forum. 
where all the women came from every county and these women came and decided that this should be the agenda of the new government going forward. This is what they would like to see. So we hope to see that implemented eventually by the Minister of Gender and the, and the President working in consultation with all the women groups. So there's always work to be done even after the elections. Well, the funding for the WSR varies from country to country, but uh, our major funder and our first funder was UNDP, the United Nations Development Program under Mr. Dominic Sam, who was then UNDP director here in Liberia with the help of Ms. Shebra Boyce, who was his gender advisor. And she continued to encourage it. As a matter of fact, she continues to be with WSR wherever we go. We've also had the Finnish government has sponsor it, the Swedes have sponsored it. Norway is now our biggest sponsor. They sponsored us in Ghana, they've sponsored us in Liberia, and they just sponsor us in, uh, in Sierra Leone. So Norway continues to see the value of the women's situation room and the work that we do. So uh, African Women Development Fund is also a big funder of it, especially when it comes to deal with the youth. AWDF, we held our first gang summit and AWDF was very important and influential in seeing that that gang summit happen. We also have UNOAS, the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Seychelles, and they also sponsor the WSR as does Urgent Action Fund. And Urgent Action Fund is one of our major funders, again, dealing with the youth and our presidential debates when we have them during the election to bring awareness. Our talking bus was sponsored by USAID, and that is a mechanism that we brought up recently in the Liberian elections in where we had the talking bus go into different communities and ignite the conversation regarding first during the registration period where the talking bus dealt with what do you want the people coming into campaign to know about your community? What are your community issues and how are you going to address them? What do you know about budgets? When so a politician can't come and tell you, say, I'm building a wall over there or I'm building a house over there for you by next month because you know the budget has already been passed and he's constricted by those, the budgetary allotment. So he can't do it next month or the month after it will take another year. So the talking bus ignited that. Also, the talking bus ignited the situation upholding the rule of law in Liberia. For the first time in the history of Liberia, we actually got to the Supreme Court with issues that were brought on by Unity Party regarding the elections. And the whole country was held in abeyance for weeks as the Supreme Court deliberated on what was happening. But the point is, our people didn't understand what was happening and they thought this was a waste of time and they couldn't understand it. But bringing in the talking bus, and actually sending it out in communities with lawyers on board who are able to explain to them the constitution of Liberia and the electoral laws of Liberia, not just in English, but in their own local language. And that they in turn could ask questions and ignite that conversation and have it ongoing. Started lots of people understanding the electoral process and how it happens. Understanding that if I go and elect you as my representative, you are upholding the constitution of Liberia. And if we want to change, they will have to come back to us again. So those are the important things that the talking bus does, which is one of our tools in the women's situation room. The WSR is different. We are interventionists. We are conflict resolutionists in real time. We don't write things and then send reports and then wait for them. We actually resolve things as they happen. If you will look at the WSR, things that are happening in it means that sometimes we have to get up and go places that we're uncomfortable going. I'll give you an example in Uganda. We had a situation at two o'clock in the morning because we were open 24 hours when we're actually running the room. So the women, the eminent women are in the room 24 hours. So at two o'clock in the morning, I'm there, a call comes in from Kampala and it says that a new Hilton hotel that's being built has in it people who are stuffing ballot boxes. 
and they're stuffing ballot boxes and this has been going on so they wanted us to know about it well it's two o'clock in the morning number one number two who are we going to send there the police who they already said were in, uh, implicated in it elections commission who will say they hadn't seen anything or they don't know about it and can't waste their time they were so busy at that time so we're like no we the women will go two o'clock in the morning i form a delegation send a delegation out to the hilton hotel that's being built luckily in that delegation is reverend canon diana in Siga, and she is actually one of the, the only woman canon of the cathedral of uganda so she goes there luckily right next to, the hilton hotel is right next to the cathedral and the parishioner is the person who is a gate man so when he sees her he's like what happened it's three o'clock in the morning what are you doing here so then she says to him, we have to go in. I'm from the women's situation room. We understand people are stuffing ballot boxes. I need to go through every room. So she and her delegation at that time of the morning go through every room in the New Hilton Hotel that's being built, not even finished construction. They find nothing there and they come back. The point is we could rely on what they found. The fact that they went through every room and could come back and report to us nothing was found is fine. Not only that, we intervene in other things. When things occur, we get up and we go there. When the situation happened in Sierra Leone, that the military and the police went ahead and surrounded the home of one of the, uh, of the leaders, one of the candidates, Mata Bio, who is now the president of Sierra Leone, and surrounded his entire home. And we didn't understand what was going on and why was he being surrounded? Because the allegations first were that he had guns, then afterwards we heard he had hacking. And we said, no, we gotta go and find out what's going on. Because we've met with this man, we don't believe that he would be involved in these things. And if he is, we need to know and put a stop to it. So we get up and we go to his house. And we were able to defuse the entire situation. President Mahama was there as well, and he was very helpful. So we were able to help go in, help defuse it, and get everything back down. The police eventually left because when we started asking for documentation and reasons for them being there, we couldn't get any good answers. They finally realized we were going to be persistent in getting answers and seeing documentation and they got up and left. So the women's situation room, we go where other people fear to trot. We will go in the ghettos behind our young people. We will do it because that's where our work is. And if we don't engage these young people, we'll continue to have problems. So that's what makes us different from any other observation group. Well, the champion of the WSR is Her Excellency Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the former president of Liberia, the first woman president in Africa. She is the champion and she was asked to be champion in 2012 when we took the women's situation room to the African Union. And it's at that time the Women of the Gender is My Agenda campaign asked her to be the, be the champion of the room and the male uh, presidents also agreed that she should champion the room. One of the things that we asked for that whoever, whichever president was going to champion the room, had we had to be sure that person wasn't running for elections again because we have a conflict of interest. And therefore, at that time, she was the only person that they knew for sure wasn't running again because she had already declared that this was her last term. So we were very comfortable in having her as the champion of the room. And it's very important, and I'll tell you why, it's important that she is champion. As champion of the room, she gave us access to every president in the world and also to the Secretary General of the United Nations. She has that reach. Therefore, post-electoral period, which is the most violent period that we have, people think it's the day people go to vote. No, the day people go to vote, you don't have violence. It is when the results are announced. That's when violence erupts and that's post-election and it continues until people are able to accept that those are the results so we do a lot of work post-elections and she is very vital to us for that because if we need someone 
to reach one of the candidates to accept the results. They will rather listen to people like her, who is a politician, than people like the women who are not politicians. Because it will make more sense that I, who have been through the political process and have achieved the presidency, I can talk to you and say, oh look, I didn't become president overnight. It didn't, wasn't the first time when I became president of Liberia. I didn't tear my country apart. I didn't put the youth on the street. But whereas you listen to somebody like me, it's like, oh, that woman doesn't know what she's talking about. She's never had, she never put everything together to run a campaign, whereas Ellen Johnson certainly has. So if she talks to them, it's a different way than if were I to talk to them or any other eminent woman in the eminent woman room.